you cannot have um, a world of fiat currencies coexisting with currencies which are convertible into real money, which throughout history, from Diocletian's time, its purchasing power has been constant. So, uh, yeah, I mean, fiat currencies, I, I'm afraid they're toast. As soon as someone presses the trigger and says, right, here is our gold standard, and assuming it's, it's put together credibly, then fiat currencies is the, is the end of them. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for September 11th through 18th, 2023, while supplies last. First, when you purchase a bundle of five 10-ounce Nordic Mint bars and five 5-ounce bars, all 10 bars are priced at just $1.89 over spot per ounce. Three nines fine silver, these are priced lower than anything else other than full-size Comex bars, but obviously offer far better liquidity. The Gold Eagle was first released in 1986 and has been one of the most popular gold bullion coins in the world, providing incredible recognizability and investor trust. The one-tenth Eagle is additionally sought after for its high degree of flexibility and liquidity. Like the one-ounce Eagle, the one-tenth Eagle is 22 karat gold strengthened with copper. Its one-tenth of a troy ounce of gold comes 50 to a tube, 5,000 to a box, and is available at just $37.50 over melt while supplies last. Finally, the Gold Eagle is IRA eligible. Next, from Valcambi, a Swiss mint known for producing some of the highest quality products in precious metals, we have Kilo Silver Bars, which are 32.15 troy ounces of 3 nines fine silver, cast with individual serial numbers and a beautiful antique-style finish. They are only $1.99 over spot per ounce. They come 15 to a box and are IRA eligible. And for your choice silver rounds, you may choose between the iconic Silver Buffalo Round made by various private mints across the U.S. and the Silver Asahi Round from Japan, both 3 nines fine, both 20 to a tube. The Asahi Rounds are also IRA eligible. And if you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us, and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always glad to have this particular returning guest, Alistair McLeod, not only a former bank director, but also head of research currently at Gold Money Incorporating Shift Gold, is with us this Tuesday, September 12th, 2023. Alistair, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. That's very much my pleasure, Dunnigan. We are due for an update with you and from you about a couple of major topics that you have alerted us to over the past couple of years and with increasing frequency and frankly urgency as things have developed. That is the stability of the banking system or instability and also the uh, emergence of a non-Western currency from the BRICS plus block of nations uh, announced or discussed at least at their at their conference in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa last month. Uh, we'd like to get updates from you on both those topics, as well as a caution that you are going to be writing about this week. I understand about the a crisis emerging in minor currencies around the world. So could we kick it off first off with an understanding of what you see happening with the banking system? A lot of people in the U.S. following the second quarter of this year where there were the failure of the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures ever in the US, as well as uh, Credit Suisse in Switzerland, have raised a lot of concern for people. It's gotten a little bit quieter since with a few minor bank failures since, but the response from officialdom was not at all reassuring to people who are concerned about the stability and safety of their deposits in the banking system. Can you bring us up to date on your latest research in that area? Yes, sure. I think the first thing I should say is that um, the authorities do place a huge, huge, great uh, importance on ensuring that no depositors rule their money, lose their money. I mean, apart from anything else, um, the FDIC, uh, which insures deposits up to, was it $150,000 or $250,000? 250, yeah. yeah. I mean, it hasn't actually got the funds to uh, deal with the widespread banking crisis. So, um, banks will be rescued. Now, having said that, um, obviously, it would be a very, very worrying time if we have uh, a resurgence of banking problems. Um, now, I think we are definitely going to have that, unfortunately. And uh, the reasons are 
uh, really revolve around interest rates and bond yields. Um, I think there's a sort of widespread belief that um, apart from maybe another quarter or a half percent or so, the rise in interest rates is now coming to an end and it will be followed by lower interest rates through uh, 2024 and into 2025. The fact of the matter is that we are in a credit crunch, a credit crisis where credit is being restricted. You just look at everything. I mean, the way in which money supply is behaving, by which we mean credit, basically, bank credit. Look at um, uh, the sort of surveys, if you like, of lending officers, which um, is one of the better statistics that comes out of uh, the St. Louis Fed, they're all pointing the same direction. And the reason for this is that banks are over leveraged on their balance sheets. They see risk. They do not want to ex extend that risk, risk which is mounting um, with the prospect of recession coming around the corner. Um, I mean, I know we've been waiting for this recession, but it is happening. I mean, the problem is the statistics don't really capture the information. But if you just follow your nose, you can see that, yes, this recession is definitely beginning. And the driver of it um, is likely to be the contracting bank credit. So you've got the situation where banks are withdrawing credit because they're over leveraged and they are guaranteeing that uh, there will be a recession. Um, the hope that the Keynesians would have that a recession would lead to lower prices and that means that the Fed could lower interest rates is completely misplaced because they got it the wrong way around. What happens when you get a recession is companies start, uh, stop producing and they lay off people, they lay off stuff. So what happens is that you get a contraction of the quantity of goods almost before you get um, a contraction in consumer demand. It's not quite as simple as that, but basically that's the thing to bear in mind. And the reason that the Keynesians don't understand this is because uh, Keynes in his uh, general theory, one of the first things he did was uh, introduce uh, Say's Law. Now, this is something I wrote about, I think, last week. So if you go to Go Money website, you'll see my article on it, which will explain that more fully. Um, the other problem is that with this continuing credit crunch and the fact, and I would say this is a fact, uh, in anticipation of it happening, so it will be a fact, that um, uh, inflation, as it were, measured by uh, consumer prices is not going to diminish in the way which markets expect, expect, then interest rates are going to continue to rise. Now, under those circumstances, rising interest rates will also undermine stock markets, uh, bond prices in particular. So you'll find that banks will try and get out of uh, long maturities. They'll get into very short maturity, treasury bills, that sort of thing. Um, and you're bound to have banks failing along the way. And it's interesting to see that the Fed's facility, whereby um, it takes in um, uh, U.S. Treasury and agency debt at par, um, and then lends the bank, um, rather like a sort of extended reverse repo, uh, cash in, in, in instead at par value for one year. One year, bear in mind. Um, I mean, it'll obviously be rolled if the, you know, if the problem continues. Uh, then, um, you know, that's beginning to increase again. So, um, and if we look at the yields on bonds, I mean, they've backed off from the very, very high highs, which we saw very, very recently. But this feels to me very much like, um, you know, something temporary. And um, it's not going to take very much to drive 10-year uh, maturity government bond yields significantly higher. So, so this is a very fragile situation, uh, Dunnigan. And I think that um, on the next rise in bond yields in particular, you'll find that this banking crisis will get into another phase. And... Um, it's not just in, in America, it's elsewhere, it's in Europe. And we also have a problem which I think is going to begin to surface. Um, it has been discussed in certain quarters, and that is the position of central banks' own balance sheets. Um, interestingly, my attention was drawn um, uh, to a paper which the IMF wrote back in, I think it was July, looking at the losses on the member banks of the ECB. 
No, I mean, it's quite a long paper, um, but scanning it, I see that um, their assumptions that um, the crisis will eventually go away are really based on market assumptions that um, inflation is not really a, a problem for the future. You know, once it starts diminishing from current levels, it's going to continue to diminish. And uh, on that basis, um, uh, you know, interest rates will come down. So they're looking at lower interest rates in uh, certainly the second half of next year and uh, going on from there. So, um, but we're approaching the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you look at what's happening to particularly heating oil prices, which is a proxy for diesel prices, they are through the roof. They're up 45% in the last quarter. Now that diesel is terribly important because it's, um, it drives all our logistics. Um, I mean, I know a few years ago, it was 98% of this country's logistics. It's probably a little less than that. But when I say a little less, we're talking maybe 95%, not 98%. So, you know, diesel prices are extremely important. Um, why is this happening? Well, it's happening partly because um, oil from which distillers like heating oil, diesel uh, is extracted has been cut. I mean, you had a cut of 2 million barrels a day by OPEC plus. And then more recently, you had a further 1.3 uh, million barrels per day, 300 by um, 300,000 by Russia, a million by Saudi Arabia. And that's going to be extended well into the winter, like um, towards January, it's thought. And on top of that, what the Russians have done is they've said, oh, we've got to maintain our diesel refinery. So um, they're cutting their diesel output by, I can't remember, I think something like a quarter or a half of the total. So, you know, this is this is crisis on crisis on crisis designed, in my view, to drive up energy prices in Europe over the winter months and reignite, if you like, this inflation crisis. So um, the response from uh, central banks, basically central banks are hampered by lack of capital. So, uh, you know, as this starts going wrong, you can see that outfits like the IMF will be going, oh, hum, ho, oh, hum, you know, we didn't think this was going to happen. We better, you know, we'll, we better keep quiet about the situation at the ECB, the euro system and so on and so forth. But you can be sure other people will pick it up. And um, I think that that stage you will find it won't just be American regional banks in trouble, but I think you'll find that there will be banks in Europe in trouble as well. But to summarize, I think what we're going to see is we're going to see an extension of the inflation problem, an extension of the credit crunch, therefore higher interest rates, higher bond yields, uh, lower stock markets, lower bond markets in terms of prices, um, and uh, this will start taking out banks again. In your focus there was primarily on uh, inflationary related pressures, interest rate pressures and bond pressures that are going to uh, make the bank's uh, assets uh, out of whack with their liabilities. What about commercial real estate? There's been some talk about a coming uh, tsunami or, or cliff or whatever of, of renewals in the third and fourth quarter in the U.S. in particular, maybe it's globally, of commercial real estate when you've got all these zombie companies with non-recourse uh, non loans that they just can walk away from skyscrapers and, and large office buildings and that sort of thing, leaving the banks holding the bag. Any concern about commercial real estate being another, another um, straw on the camel's back of the banks here? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the last time we had that problem in this country in particular was in, um, I think it was October or November 1973. And that took out a whole slew of small banks which specialized in property finance. Yeah, it's going to happen again. Um, and uh, <clears throat> not just in America, um, not just shopping malls and office space and all the rest of it, but around the world, I think that's going to be a problem. Anything which has relied on cheap credit and um, is still relying on cheap credit is vulnerable to that. And um, there is the further problem, I think, with office property. I don't know what's happening in America, but in this country, so many people now working from home um, you know, that actually uh, there is surplus office space, which nobody predicted. Uh, and that, I think, is going to weigh very, very heavily on a market, which um, already is being undermined by um, rocketing financing costs.
In addition to these pressures on the banks, uh, we've also been cautioned by you about the significance of the emergence of a the BRICS plus block of nations that are pivoting away from the U.S. dollar or the entire Western financial system for a variety of reasons. Can you bring us up to date on your takeaways from the recent summit that they held in Johannesburg uh, last month and any any uh, thoughts about what the uh, the key developments are that uh, were were uh, revealed there that you think are significant that people need to keep an eye on? Perhaps I'll start with the significant developments, and that was the inclusion of a number of other countries um, uh, as of this January in BRICS, taking it from five to eleven, uh, and uh, that is, I think, a preliminary move. Um, and I think you'll find that more countries get added um, under Russia's chairmanship of BRICS, which starts from January the 1st. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but I think the, the thing that, that, that is of most interest is the politics behind um, a new trade settlement currency. Now, um, we do know uh, there have been enough um, clues, hints, whatever, um, articles and so on and so forth coming out of authoritative sources in Russia that um, uh, a new BRICS currency was planned and it was going to be presented at this currency at this sorry at the at the um, uh, summit in Johannesburg now um, the reason it wasn't I would put down to two members in particular one was China and the other is India now China it's not China's style to go in and rock the boat um, it would rather I mean, it takes a very long view. I mean, you know, they're proud of being a civilization of, I don't know, two, three thousand years or whatever. I mean, Confucius, um, you know, was around at about the time of um, the Greek philosophers, in fact, was slightly before. So, I mean, there's a very, very long history and they're very proud of that. And they see, you know, us Westerners as sort of upstarts. But the way in which a long um, or if you like, a civilization with a long history works is not by trying to implement change, you know, like that. Russia is very different. As far as Russia is concerned, she's fighting a financial war with the West and um, uh, she um, would rather take a more aggressive stance. Uh, so I think that explains China's reluctance. Um, India as well uh, has a problem. India is really between two worlds. It's... Um, a nation whose um, prospects are expanding very rapidly, um, not just in terms of its Asian connections, but also with the West. It is under considerable political pressure not to tie itself too closely to China and certainly not to Russia. It is tied to Russia um, uh, traditionally, really from uh, partition back in 1940, 47, 48, whenever it was. Um, it, you know, the Gandhis in particular um, uh, tended to lean towards the Soviets. Uh, so that I think is a long standing relationship, um, which they would rather not maybe make too much of at this time. So you can see they're backing off, if you like, from this. A further point I'd like to make is that um, India is very much run on Keynesian lines. Um, so the idea of going on to a gold standard doesn't really fit with their economic philosophy. So you can see why these two nations, China and India, between them have been really rather cautious. Um, I mean, particularly if, if uh, this new BRICS gold back currency had um, come out, then um, it could have had a devastating effect on the Western alliances currencies, you know, dollar, uh, euro, sterling, uh, and, and the yen in particular. Um, because it is, you cannot really run fiat currencies when there is a, a gold back currency an important go back currency um, around at the same time. They're like oil and water. They really are. So so um, it could have been very, very destructive if it worked. So <clears throat> I think it was just kicked into the long grass for the moment. Um, however, what's interesting is I've been looking at the way in which some of these currencies have been behaving. And um, I think some of your um, listeners may be aware that the Russian ruble has been very weak recently. I mean, bear in mind that um, it rallied. I mean, the, the, the pricing is upside down. So when I say it's a low figure, it's actually a strong ruble. Um, 
it rallied to around about 60 to the dollar. And since then, it's now collapsed and it's gone back down to around about 100. It's actually rallied a little bit and it's about 97, something like that. So um, that's quite unpleasant, as you may imagine. Now, as well as that, um, in order to stabilize it, the central bank of Russia has had to uh, increase interest rates by three, three and a half percent. So we're now looking at an interest rate of around about 12 percent. I mean, this is pretty horrific stuff. The rate of inflation is reckoned to be about 5%. Government spending is racking up. Now, the fig if you actually look at the figures, insofar as they're available, because um, the, the, you know the Russians aren't exactly giving out a lot of information on their economy at the moment, but if you actually look at the figures, they're not nearly as bad as you would think from the way the, perform the currency is performing. I'll come back to that in a second. Chinese yuan has got inflation at zero. <clears throat> um, and uh, you have got, I mean, I suppose Keynesian would say it's looking a bit deflationary, as it were. So there is no reason why the Chinese yuan should be weak. The Chinese yuan is, I mean, you look at the chart and you think, oops, it's got um, quite a lot further to go on the downside. Again, you know, we're looking at something which uh, the higher the number, the weaker the yuan is. Um, and then if you look at the rupee, I mean, that looks potentially disastrous. If it breaks down from current levels, um, which around about, um, I think, 70 odd, 72, something like that, it actually looks like a fast track to 100. You know, again, 100 is a very, very weak rupee. Um, so what's this telling us? Well, I mean, what we do see is that the dollar trade weighted has been rallying, but the tra dollar's trade weighted is um, very heavily weighted towards the major other currencies. I mean, particularly the euro, uh, the yen, secondly, and, and sterling as well, and a few others like Swiss franc and so on. But um, this, this is um, a, a rather different world from what seems to be going on in the emerging markets. I mean, the emerging market currencies, we, we, you know, what's happening, I think, is that uh, the credit worthiness of these minor currencies is rapidly evaporating in the current situation. So even though the dollar is going down in terms of its purchasing power, they're going down even faster. So, um, Going back to Russia, what does Russia do? Well, I mean, the, I think the answer is that Russia has got to go on to a gold standard as quickly as possible. Now, a lot of people would say, well, you know, they're in the middle of a war. The last thing that anyone in the middle of the war can do is to go on the gold standard. But I don't agree with that. I mean, it's, it's certainly been the case from, you know, in this country, in the Napoleonic Wars, we went off the gold standard. First World War, we went off the gold standard. We went back on to a gold bullion standard in 1925, which lasted in 1932. Um, and uh, then we went off the that bullion standard. It didn't take a war to do it. But the idea that we could have financed uh, the Second World War on a gold standard um, is regarded by most people as completely ridiculous. Um, Russia's spending is actually not all that great. I mean, I know that um, America throws an awful lot of money, dollars, at um, military expenditure, but Russia managed to get by on far, far less. And uh, I think that um, even with the current situation and military expenditure doubling over last year, which seems to be roughly what's happening, uh, we're looking at around about $10 billion equivalent military spending. I mean, you know, $10 billion. I mean, this is not a huge, huge figure. Uh, on that basis, um, and bearing in mind that uh, the government debt to GDP ratio is about 17.5%, would you believe? I mean, no. Um, also, when you look at um, the um, tax rates, income tax, 13%. Uh, flat rate, and you look at corporation tax, that's a bit more, that's at 20%. Um, I mean, obviously, there are other taxes, you know, the sales taxes and things like that. But, you know, th this is an economy, which if it had a stable currency, it would actually take off. And it can afford to continue the war against, um, you know, against NATO through Ukraine. So, to me, I, I think that um, it's becoming desperately important for the Russians to stabilize their currency because they're not getting the recognition for their f underlying um, strengths, if you like, uh, uh, in, in foreign currency markets. So 
uh, but it's very easy for them to do this. Um, and uh, I think the principal uh, thing which I would recommend, and I'm, again, I'm I'm actually drafting an article which will be published on the Shift Girl website on Thursday and on the Go Money website following Monday. So if you'd like to look out for either of those, you'll see it. I explain how this can be done. <coughs> and even though she's got something like 2,300 tons, you'd probably think that's not enough actually to, to uh, you know, run a proper gold standard. Well, uh, the experience of the gold standard we had in the wake of the um, 1844 Bank Charter Act was that what really drove gold flows, in those days it was between different nations on different gold standards, was the differential in the uh, deposit rate. Um, and um, or in those days it was called the discount rate because, you know, you, it was a discount rate rather than an interest rate which accumulated. Um, and uh, for the very simple reason that, put it this way, if um, uh, a bank um, uh, is offered by the Bank of Russia, which is the case at the moment, 12% to establish, um, you know, an exchange in terms of gold for rubles, right? It is effectively getting 12% on gold. So after one year, 100 ounces becomes 112. Okay, well, how do you finance that? Well, the answer is you go into Western markets where the lease rate for gold is around about 2%. Now, that equates roughly to what you would get if you deposited gold uh, and loaned it out to someone else. So 2% is your cost of obtaining the bullion and 12% is your return by giving it to the Bank of Russia or the, what I would call the, the issue department, which has to be completely separate. And the issue department manages the deposit rate. It's nothing to do with the economy anymore. It's all about managing the level of gold reserves held in the issuing department. I mean, it's quite simple. The first of all, the Russian banks will be doing this. I think you will find that a lot of the Russian expats, oligarchs and all the rest of it, many who, who, of, of which have ended up in places like Dubai, have got out because, um, you know, they were concerned about um, uh, the, you know, potential instability of the ruble and uh, um, the possibility that perhaps Russia might not win this war, possibly they might be even be called up. I think those people would return their money very, very rapidly uh, through the banking system uh, into the ruble. So, this, I mean, the, the, it, it, I think it would reverse capital flows really quite quickly. Then, when there is sufficient um, capital, gold bullion capital in the issue department, at that stage, it can then start normalizing interest rates, not in terms of, um, you know, if you like, trying to control money supply. No, not at all. Controlling the level of bullion reserves in the issue department, that is going to be the function of it. And that way, Russia could very, very quickly, I mean, in a matter of months, um, not only establish uh, a, 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 a new um, uh, gold-backed ruble, in other words, fully exchangeable into rubles, it will probably need about six months to design a new coin, which I reckon would be a 50,000 ruble coin, which would equate with uh, it's about five hundred dollars. Um, it would also equate with um, our gold sovereign, which is priced around about a little bit under four hundred pounds. So you can see that it would, you know, it would be a coin of similar to what we've already got, um, and um, that would probably take about six months. But there's no reason why the bullion exchange uh, part of it cannot be done immediately. And the Russian banks, I think, would go in, go for it very, very quickly because of the arbitrage opportunity. And of course, this has a knock on effect. We have sanctions against Russia. London can't do anything about it. But what can happen is a Middle Eastern agent, say from Dubai, where, you know, which is a major gold center in, in, in the Middle East, I mean, he walks into London and just cleans out the market <laughs> because of the arbitrage opportunity. The price of gold is irrelevant in all this. What matters is 2%, 10%. What's not to like about the differential? And that will drive the gold very, very rapidly into the issue department, the newly created issue department of the Central Bank of Russia. Easy peasy, it really is. 
Well, it's not the first time that you've suggested a course of action that would benefit uh, Putin to seriously consider in the face of this uh, more or less united front between uh, Western Europe and NATO and the U.S. and so on. Um, and uh, wondering how that uh, changes your outlook that you've been laying out for us for the last year or so about the fragility of the euro, the fragility of the European banks, etc. Uh, does this this Russian wild card um, or potential for Russia to take a, a, a self-interested stance that, that could really put pressure on other banks, does that change any of your other um, cautions that you've given to us about the stability of either Japanese or or uh, euro zone currencies, etc. Uh, it would make it more intense. I mean, don't get me wrong. I wish we could do this. I really do. Um, I would far rather we did this than the Russians. But we're not, you know, we're not mentally attuned to do this. Um, you know, the whole of the establishment is all about plucking the money tree, the magic money tree. And, uh, you know, the, the the currency is a matter for the state, not for people like you and I. The Russians can return it to the people, and that, that is the key thing. As to your question about um, how it changes the outlook, um, I think it just makes it more intensely um, negative for us because, as I said earlier, I think that um, gold standards are rather like oil and water. I mean, apart from anything else, I think that the Russians did that. It would actually force the new BRICS currency to come into an existence. Because again, that would, I mean, it would be structured differently because it's doing a different purpose. But, um, you know, and uh, where does that leave um, other fiat currencies? It's actually going to be quite destructive of other fiat currencies, which raises the question, um, what are the Saudis going to do? I think the Saudis would follow the Russians very, very quickly. Um, because um, they would want to secure, not only secure their own currency, but they would want um, uh, other nations to pay in gold, if you like, uh, to match their situation. I think the Chinese would be pushed into it, um, maybe unwillingly. Um, whether it's unwillingly, I don't know. It could be that the Chinese might heave a huge sigh of relief and say, well, thank God someone's taken the lead, we won't get blamed. So. There's a, you know, um, but I mean, the point is that you cannot have um, a world of fiat currencies coexisting with currencies which are convertible into real money, which throughout history, from Diocletian's time, its purchasing power has been constant. You cannot have a fiat currency world coexisting with that. The fiat currencies fall apart. And it affects everybody. I mean, um, uh, not 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 just our currencies, but also emerging markets. They're going to have to respond to this very, very quickly as well. But they are in a position to do so if they can understand what is involved. And I think their learning process could be very, very rapid. You know, you, the um, metaphor you used of oil and water about how they just can't uh, coexist for a long period of time because mm -hmm. true money, the sound money, will expose and drive out the uh, false money, the fiat Keynesian currencies. It the thing that's fascinating is, is, is that it's usually said the other way around, and that is the bad money drives out the good. It drives out of circulation. We hang on to the good stuff. <laughs> this is Gresham's law, basically. We hang on to the good stuff. And, you know, this was um, in Elizabethan terms when coins were clipped. So you go through your change and you say, well, that's clipped too much. But that, that one's good. I'll hang on to that. And I'll spend that. So that was the that was the origin of it. <laughs> well, it reminds me of and people in our viewing audience, I'm sure, can relate to some of these. There was an article that came out a few months ago. I believe it was on Zero Hedge uh, called The Importance of zero and the article was written that in a world of almost universal lies it's absolutely necessary to stifle uh, to have zero truth tellers you know it's like the it's like the story of the emperor having uh, new clothes and finally the one the one little boy shouts he's got no clothes on and then everybody's okay to tell the truth uh it's that the idea in the case when when the elite when the government when uh, the fascist states are all subsisting on a on a platform that's built on lies upon lies upon lies it's important that there be zero truth tellers out there just as any amount of light even one candle can drive away the darkness of a room and it sounds like what you're saying is that uh it's the 
the Keynesian fiat currency uh, edifice that's been built, this huge house of cards and derivatives upon top of that that have been built uh, would be very vulnerable uh, to the emergence of a sound uh, gold-backed uh, currency in, in competition because there's no competition there from a, in a fair uh, playing field. Can you expand on that aspect? Yeah, I mean, so, so you know, how is um, fiat currency valued? I mean, a monetarist would say it depends on the quantity in circulation. Um, but no, it's actually um, America came up. I think it was uh, something in Congress about something completely different. Full faith and credit in the U.S. government. That's it. And if the faith and credit, you know, evaporates, uh, the currency evaporates. It's as simple as that. And if you will look at the... Uh, difference between many of the currencies in um, the emerging markets and the dollar. I mean, the dollar is obviously king of all the fiat currencies. Um, but where, let us say, an emerging market economy is run on better lines than the US economy, uh, at least from um, a, you know, a credit point of view, what happens to their currency? It just goes down the pan. Why? Because if anyone's going to have any faith and credit in a currency, it is going to be in the dollar. It's not going to be in some minor country um, where you don't really need to hold any of that currency anyway. You know, I mean, if you get some through trade, you just immediately flog it into the foreign exchange markets. You might hang on to the dollar because, you know, you're going to be doing other business which requires dollars sort of thing. So. I mean, it's it, you know, it was a point that uh, Ludwig von Mises made about the errors of um, you know monetarism. Uh, you know, it, it, it's completely wrong. It actually, uh, you know, a currency depends where it's fiat. If it's not backed by gold, if it's not readily convertible into gold, its value depends on what the markets make of it, the faith and credit that the markets have in that currency. It's got no sheet anchor. It's not tied to anything. Now, as soon as you get gold in there, as soon as you have a credibly backed um, a gold backed currency, then, um, you know, you know, you can have that. In fact, um, for uh, years and years and years and years, um, nobody in Switzerland bothered having any any gold coin or anything like that, they were holding any coin because they had the faith that um, the central bank would hold sufficient reserves that they wouldn't have to do it themselves. Now, things have changed a bit, I have to say, in recent decades there. But you can see the point um, that as long as it is gold backed, then as long as you can exchange it into gold, no fiat currency can stand up against that. It then means that, I mean, if the ruble did it, um, the dollar would be I mean, it would be toast. It really would. Uh, and apart from anything else, I mean, it could set off a tsunami of um, uh, 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 reserve movement out of uh, fiat currencies into into gold. Now, I'm not recommending this as, um, you know, because I'm a bull of gold and all the rest of it. I'm just trying to look at it purely from uh, an economic uh, uh, point of view and analyzing it from that point of view. But undoubtedly, um, it will have a, uh, an effect on the value in, of, of gold. But in terms of the exchange rate with the fiat currencies, most of the effect will be on the decline in the purchasing power of the fiat currencies. Remember, the purchasing power of gold holds steady over time. I mean, it, <clears throat> if you look at the price of oil in rubles, for example, um, uh, I put together a chart, uh, which I haven't got in front of me, but it's, um, you know, it, I think... Um, it was something like uh, around about, um, uh, you know, a barrel of oil was about 2.03 um, grams per barrel back in 1992. It's currently 1.4, you know, so it's fallen in terms of oil. But in rubles, it's gone up over 7,000 7, times. You know, why? Because the ruble has lost its purchasing power. I mean, 7,000 times. So I think seven and a half was the actual figure. Well, the chart will be in the article, so you, you'll see it there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, fiat currencies, I, I'm afraid they're toast. As soon as someone presses the trigger and says, right, here is our gold standard, and assuming it's, it's put together credibly, then fiat currencies is the, is the end of them. That's been one of the criticisms that's leveled by 
analysts whom we've uh, interviewed on our channel about the potential for emergence of a gold-backed currency is if it's not if it is if it's not convertible for an ordinary mortal then what what good is it how why would you have any trust in the uh, the authorities that are supposedly you know claiming that they've got this gold backing you know do you really think you're going to walk into moscow and and claim i want my gold and, and get it if you're a, a non-russian citizen etc etc um any thoughts from you to to temper your enthusiasm for the the impact of a gold-backed currency if the world doesn't trust the the keepers of it who's watching the watchers and and if it's not really convertible for universally for everyone internationally there's no reason why why um uh, i mean if, if i go back to the example of the ruble there's no reason why that shouldn't be available to everybody as i say i mean the the ruble is so low i mean basically a ruble is one cent i mean it's that it is it, so um you, you you know you can't have a gold coin the equivalent of one cent i mean it's just ridiculous which is why i say about 50,000 so if you have um you know the, the basic unit uh, you know, of a gold coin represents 50,000 rubles. That would be um, in line with current prices, gold prices in the, in, in the, in the market. So, so um, there's no reason why that can't happen, none whatsoever. Um, and uh, the point which I don't think people have really fully grasped is that it's very easy for um, the Bank of Russia, if it separates it out into an, into, um, an issue department, to attract the bullion uh, into into it. Uh, apart from anything else, we know that they've got 2,300 tons, which is a start. Um, we believe, uh, and uh, it would be helpful if this was clarified, there are two funds in Russia. Um, one is the Precious Metals Fund, the State Precious Metals Fund, and the other is the State Wealth Fund. And between them, it is believed that they own a further seven to 9,000 tons. We don't know, but that is the sort, that's the story. If that was confirmed, that would help the credibility of the thing initially. But it's not necessary for that to be, um, if you like, deposited in the new SU department in return for rubles. I mean, it would be sensible to happen. But the key point is this arbitrage, this arbitrage between getting paid 12% and costing 2%. Bullion will flow like a I don't know, you know, a reverse waterfall, if you like, into the new issue department, because the banks will arbitrage it. And we're talking not just the Russian banks, the Russian banks would certainly start it. Uh, you would have, um, you know, people who've sold out from the ruble, you know, Russian, uh, uh, Russian nationals who, who have, you know, draft dodgers and all the rest of it with capital and they would be going they would be moving very very rapidly back into it and on top of that you've got the whole of the shanghai cooperation organization which can link through um the various um uh, uh, messaging systems the equivalent of swift which exists between russia china and so on and so forth i mean these banks would go for it and there's no reason why um uh, russia doesn't open it up to swift but swift is suspended russians can't access it i mean there's no reason why your bank shouldn't be able to um you know send gold over there and get effectively 12 percent paid in gold on top of your gold you know i mean so this is easy i mean it really is extremely easy there are various things that have to be put in place to ensure that the checks and balances of the system will endure i mean apart from anything else one of the problems that we've always had with the gold standard in the past is that um, you have the cycle of bank credit. Now, when things are expanding, it's all lovely and, you know, we're all very happy. But every now and then you get a crisis and it's sort of in the West, it's been roughly every 10 years. So <clears throat> how do you deal with the crisis? Well, the answer is to make that responsibility of the banking department, but not the responsibility of the issue department. Whereas in the past, what's happened is that um, the Bank of England in the 19th century, it had to suspend the Bank Charter Act um, of 1844, three years later in 1847, 10 years after that in 1857, and then nine years after that in uh, 1866, when the over end Gurnick crisis happened. Um, but the interesting thing is in the second two, um, what happened was that uh, the government authorized the suspension of the act 
on condition that the Bank of England uh, did not lend out, did not make credit available in effect uh, to struggling banks um, at less than 10% interest. But it was the freeing up of the credit which resolved the problem, not the price of it. So it seems to me that there's no reason why the issue department can't, can't take total charge of the management of um, uh, the interest rate away from the banking department. And the banking department just has to operate within that, that uh, context. No reason why that can't uh, work at all. You don't need to reduce interest rates down to something really low to try and rescue the banking system. No, you've just got to be there ready to backstop it with credit to, you know, set up good bank, bad bank, you know, whatever, whatever mechanism works. So <clears throat> this, I think, on the lines which I propose in the article, which you'll see um, uh, later this week and early next week, um, I, th I see no reason why it shouldn't work. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, we'll see whether the thinkers in Russia share my opinion. Well, it's always uh, eye-opening and interesting to have your visits here with us, Alistair. You keep us aware. We, we learn. Uh, I think we should all get like honorary PhDs after four or eight years of, of, uh, of learning from you on this channel. And we're grateful for your presence here on behalf of all of our viewers. Folks, check out Alistair's work at both goldmoney.com and Shift Gold. And uh, if you don't want to miss a single interview with Alistair, make sure you sign up for our free newsletter at Liberty and Finance, all one word, libertyandfinance.com. Put in your name, your email address, and click submit. You'll get a confirming email. Once you confirm, you'll get one email per day in your inbox from us with our latest interviews, including all of our interviews with Alistair, any of our specials, and we don't share our mailing list with anyone else, so you won't get spam because of that. Alistair, on behalf of all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us on Liberty and Finance. Donegan, it's very much my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us. Discuss your needs and we can let you know our live inventory, prices and availability. And lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations. And the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.